At my heart, I'm a bit of a hipster, a nonconformist, a contrarian. Why make something the way it's always made when I can spend oodles of time designing it my own way and even more time making it just to achieve the same result? Yes, this is one of those captive nut puzzles, and yes, the nut does actually come off of here. But if you think you know how to solve this puzzle, think again. There's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. Fourteen pieces to be exact. Intrigued now, aren't you? Well, join me for the journey that was designing and making this new take on an age-old puzzle. For most of my projects, I start out with a pretty good idea of how I want the thing to work, and I can move on to the drafting table pretty quickly for the design. This was not one of those projects. I knew what I wanted the puzzle to do. The how, on the other hand, was, well, challenging. Solving puzzles is one thing, but designing them? Let's just say I lost a lot of sleep on this one. The real challenge isn't just making a solution work, but also making it foolproof. No shortcuts, no alternate solutions. And of course, no chance of deadlocking the puzzle together, never to be solved. But after many iterations, I landed on something that will work. Or at least I've gaslit myself into thinking it will. Now I just can't tell you the secret yet, but if you can figure it out before I reveal the solution, I've got the gold stars ready. I'm going to go ahead and give myself one though, because, well, I think I know how this works. But even for me, this is a complicated design, and I'll likely do a terrible job explaining how it works on paper. So we're going to jump straight into the build and we'll figure it out along the way. Generally, the parts fall into three categories. The obvious bits, the bolt shanks and heads. The sneaky bits, the doodads and springs on the inside. And the captive of this story, the nut. I'll start by making the obvious bits. We'll begin with the two bolt shank halves. Sorry to spoil the surprise, but in the traditional captive nut design, the main bolt isn't a single piece, but instead two threaded together to make it look seamless. This puzzle starts on that same principle, but of course there's a twist. I'll get a piece of 4140 chucked up in the lathe, face the end, then start on the inner details. First of which is a quarter inch hole through the full length. This is a relatively deep hole compared to the diameter, so there's a high possibility that the drill will drift off center by the time it breaks through the other side. This could throw off a lot of the critical alignments needed for this puzzle to work smoothly. A small boring bar or gun drill could prevent this drifting, but alas, I have neither. What I do have, though, is a workaround. After reaming the through hole to size, and also using an end mill to make a slightly larger flat bottom bore in here, again because I don't have a boring bar small enough, I'll turn away some of the material from the outside. And now for a little quantum mechanics. I won't know if this through hole actually drifted off center until I measure it, which I can't easily do. So for the time being, this hole, quantumly speaking, is simultaneously dead straight and cattywampus. Just like poor old Schrodinger's cat in the box. At least, I think that's how that thought experiment worked. I'm a bit rusty on the quantum mechanics front. It's kind of hard to piece together a solid understanding of that kind of thing from wiki articles. If only there was some easier way to learn math and science topics like this. Oh, hey buddy, what's up? Oh man, you're totally right. How could I have forgotten about Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video? Now, I hadn't heard of Brilliant until recently, but once I did, let me just tell you, the brain wiggling got absolutely out of control over here. I was literally blown away by their thousands of online lessons and everything math, science, and engineering related. Want to learn about trigonometry? Got it. How about thermodynamics? It's there. Feel like brushing up on your kinematics? No problem. And what's probably the coolest part of these lessons is, they are all interactive. Basically making them as hands-on as possible without actually having to leave your computer. Believe it or not, I started on one of their first general science lessons and quickly got the first answer wrong. But that's where Brilliant really shines. Literally every question has helpful hints and step-by-step walkthroughs of the solutions. So you can make sure you understand the principle before going any further. You really can learn at your own pace. The whole idea is to break your learning down into 5, 10, or 15 minute sessions a day, making it really easy to absorb and master new topics. But honestly, the lessons are so engaging you'll find yourself losing track of time, much like I do. 
To get started with Brilliant and see all the mathematical and scientific awesomeness they have to offer, visit Brilliant.org inheritance for your free 30-day trial. And even better, the first 200 subscribers can get a whopping 20% discount on Brilliant's annual plan. It's no secret that I love math and science, but Brilliant really does make it easy to grasp big concepts anywhere, anytime, and at your own pace. Just make sure your <clears throat> other responsibilities get done too. Anyway, back to my drifting hole problem. Since I don't have an easy way of measuring it, I have no idea if the hole stayed concentric. Fortunately, I don't need to know at all if I just support the part by the hole itself. So that's what I'll do. With a separate piece of stock mounted, I'll cut a 30 degree taper point making a chuck center. And as long as I don't remove this center from the chuck, I know it will be true to the machine. So now I can mount Schrodinger's bolt here between the chuck center and the tailstock center using a drive dog to transmit the torque. And turn down the outside the rest of the way. This approach ensures alignment between the whole axis and outside axis since I'm supporting the part by the hole itself. Completely eliminating any drift that may or may not have existed. There is of course the potential that the path of that center hole is curved, but this will be minimal enough to fall within the overall tolerances I've planned for. Now after all that, I can finally start on the outside bits. And I'm switching to the forge all this time so I can realign the part with the dial indicator. The length of this piece is critical for locating the other features, so I'll start by facing this down. And there's just enough room between the chuck jaws to slip a caliper in for a measurement. Spot on. Next is to make a sort of nubbins deal on the end. Then turn down the diameter up to the starting point of the threads. Flipping end for end, I'll re-indicate the true the part, then start turning down this side as well for a male thread. Since I don't have a female threaded test part, I'll use the three wire method to measure the progress until I'm within spec. Okay, that's as far as I can get on this for now. I need to make the other half of this duo first, bolt half B. It has a similar through hole, so I'll turn between centers again to true everything up. The bores on this one are a bit larger though, so I can actually use a boring bar. First a couple of step downs in one end, then the other end gets an even larger bore for a set of female threads that made it to the first bolt half. Now if that all went to plan, these two should thread together and be pretty concentric with one another. Nice. And the indicator agrees. With the two connected, I can now turn this major diameter down to its final size. Turning these two pieces at the same time should make this parting line disappear. Well, mostly disappear anyway. And with that, we're done on the lathe for the moment. Let's change scenery and do some mill work. I'm going to need the rotary table for a lot of this build, so it's worth the workout to get it set up. I'll get my trusty chuck adapter bolted down, and then mount the chuck still holding the bolt pair. After standing the whole thing up, tramming it in square to the mill with the dial indicator, and locating the part with the edge finder, we're ready to cut the various locking features. I'll start with some of the detents on the nubbins end. A plunging approach should reduce vibration and deflection on this small end mill, so I'm pecking away at each of the grooves 10 thou at a time. Then I can side mill the tab away between pairs of grooves by spinning the rotary table. The OD also gets a pair of J-shaped slots. So after setting the cutter height on the outside surface, I'll take several 15 thou deep passes to cut the channels to depth. Okay, those went pretty smoothly, but now I have a bit of an obstacle. I need a similar set of J channels on the opposite end of this assembly, but they need to be in line with this first set. I can't just flip this end for end in the chuck, because then I'd be covering up anything I might be able to locate by. So I'll need to make a new location feature. With the rotary table at zero degrees, I'll scribe the outer surface on center line with the tip of a spot drill. Now when I flip this around, I can just realign the tip of the cutter with this mark. But since I'm using the four jaw chuck, this will be a lot easier to realign with the indicator over on the lathe. And then back set up on the mill, I'll rotate the table until my scribe mark realigns with the point of my drill. Then just mark the new zero point on the perimeter of the table. It's not super precise, but I figure it gets me within a fraction of a degree, and I think I can work with that. 
From here, it's just rinse and repeat, cutting the two J channels on this end as well. And we're almost finished. But don't get too relaxed yet, I saved the best for last. Cutting the final set of threads on the outside of the bolt pair. I generally regard thread cutting as a pretty risky operation since you can go from a good part to a scrap part in the blink of an eye. Even scarier, this isn't going to be your average thread. Nope, I want this to be a 5 start thread. Why? Well, because I think it's cool. I'll start by setting the lathe compound to an even 0 degrees, tramming it in with the dial indicator running along the tailstock quill. I'll be adjusting the offset of each of the 5 thread starts with this compound slide. And to make these adjustments as accurate as possible, I'll use the dial indicator clamp I made a while back for just this purpose. Okay, let's cut these threads. Slow and steady is the name of the game here, but other than keeping track of which pitch I'm on for each of the thread starts, this is business as usual. Working through the threads, bringing them each down to the same depth, then checking the progress with the thread wires just like before. Alright, the risks were high, but we made it through. And that parting line between the two components is completely gone. Sneaky sneaky. With the two bolt shanks complete, I'll move on to the remaining obvious bits, the two bolt heads. I'll start off the usual way, first facing, and then pre-drilling the stock for some precision boring. In addition to opening up the diameter with the boring bar, I'm also flattening out the bottom, removing the conical shape left behind by the drill. Both the diameter and the depth of this hole need to be accurate for the mechanism to work. Looks like I got the depth right on the money. And the diameter as well, it should work. So I'll go ahead and start turning down the outside, and then immediately change my mind. That bore is going to bug me to no end, so I'll give it another go. Looks like after my recent streak of good luck, I finally have something to feed the box of shame. Oh? Oh, well, not just yet. I still need this as work-holding material. Oh, don't worry. I have this earmarked for you, buddy. Okay. Yeah, that's more like it. Just loose enough to slide on freely while still maintaining the illusion that these two could be a single piece. After turning down the outside just a bit, it's over to the mill for some more rotary table action. First I'll drill and ream a pair of holes 180 degrees apart on center line. These will be for a set of press fit pins that well, I guess I need to stop and make real quick. Hang on. I went ahead and made the pins I'll need for the second nut as well. These are turned to a half thou press fit into the holes so some mild taps with a hammer drive these in place. Last on the mill is to cut the traditional hexagonal shape making this look like an actual head of a bolt. An easy task for the rotary table as I index 60 degrees from face to face, cutting through the pins in the process which makes them pretty much disappear. But something isn't quite right. My cuts are looking visibly inconsistent for some reason. Almost like, yup, I'm no longer running on center. I should have known hammering those pins in place would knock this all out of whack. I'm just glad I caught this before I took the final passes. So after tapping the part back into alignment, I'll switch to the fly cutter and work my way around one last time taking these flats to size while also improving their surface finish over that face mill I used earlier. Not bad, but this is still missing something. Much better. After a little deburring, I'll part this off, immediately remount it with the cut face out, align that with the indicator, then faces the length, and chamfer this side as well, of course. This just leaves one final job in the mill, and that's to cut the secret pocket in the bottom of this hole. No fancy setup needed here, so right in the vise will do just fine. And after using the coaxial indicator to find the center of the part, I'll send an end mill to the bottom of this hole to cut the pocket. It's always a little weird doing blind operations like this. 
I'm completely dependent on the DRO readings in my ears while making the cuts. That, of course, doesn't stop me from habitually looking down at the part, even though I literally can't see anything that's going on. But typically, if my dimensions are good, and I stick to those dimensions, when the chips settle, everything comes out fine. That's the first bolt head finished. I went ahead and whipped up the second head as well, since it's nearly identical, just without that final pocket in the bottom. And with both parts done, I can finally address the monster in the room. You didn't think I'd break my promise, did you? This may be obvious at this point, but it's worth showing formally, I guess. The pins we drove into the sides of the bolt heads, they actually engage in the J-channels on the ends of the bolt shanks. So when I put together like so, it appears as a solid bolt. Well, almost. Everything is still a bit loosey-goosey. There are a few more special pieces we need to make. So time to change gears from the obvious bits and work on the sneaky bits. The first part plays a very big role in the illusion of this puzzle, but is so simple it hardly seems worth talking about. Just a cylindrical sleeve. So just hang tight while I whip this up real quick. See, I told you this was a simple part. Honestly, it was a nice little break from the somewhat overbaked stuff I've made up to this point. Let's get this in the assembly. This sleeve needs to be backed by a uniquely short spring I can't really buy anywhere. But rather than go through the whole learning curve of making my own, I'll just hack one out of the spring stock I have on hand. A bit unceremonious, but it will work for now. Okay, this goes in here like so, followed by a sleeve, and then the bolt head. Now with the spring pressure backing everything, the bolt head on this side actually holds itself in place. But this is still only part of the illusion. There's still one final sneaky bit to make, and this one really is the key to it all. The aptly named key pin. It's a shaft with multiple diameters, a step on one end, and a cross hole in the other. How hard could this be? I'll start off the usual way, facing and center drilling a piece of 4140 before bringing the stock out further and supporting it with a live center. And I'm going to start with the smallest diameter first. This leaves a full stock diameter out as far as possible, giving me the most support while I whittle the stem diameter smaller and smaller, which should prevent any vibration issues. Once the first diameter is the size, I'll just work my way down the line to the other two larger ones. And with all three to spec, I'll part this off. This leaves the two ends to work on, so I'll start with the larger of the two. First facing it square, but leaving it longer than expected. To really nail the fitment, I'll place the key pin in the assembly and essentially just measure how much I need to remove. Then pop this back in the lathe for a final facing cut. But as soon as I finished, I realized I completely forgot to account for the step on the end of this pin. So I basically just cut this too short. Wonderful. I guess I should go ahead and give this back now. Clearly, I don't understand my own mechanism as well as I thought. You're eating good today, aren't you, buddy? Okay, let's give this another crack. This time, I'll just turn that major diameter to the length I specified in my drawing. Then move over to the mill to cut the step. And I want this to pass right through the center of the end. Perfect. Now this will fit into the assembly as planned and I can drop the bolt head on from the other side, locking it in the J-channel before threading this together. And once it stops, measure the overall length. Then I'll remove the key pin and measure the closed overall length to work out the distance I need to remove from the pin. But something isn't looking right here. This gap between the bolt heads and the threads on each side should match. What on earth? Hmm. Oh boy. Well, I found the problem. I put down the wrong dimensions for the J channel on this side. Everything is an even sixteenth of an inch too far from the end. So basically I screwed up before I even got started. Terrific. I guess I have two options at this point. Start over, which entails not only remaking the messed up bolt half, but the other bolt half as well because the two are threaded at the same time. Or just trying to fix this one. I usually don't do this, but with faced with two extra days of work, I think the easy route is best here. 
So I'll get this chuck back up in the forge all and get it aligned with the indicator. Move this back over to the rotary table in the mill. Find the center line. Eyeball the position of the J channel with the end mill. Then set to work extending the top side of the channels, the 16th of an inch I was off to begin with. Okay, I'm not the most proud of how that turned out. It's a fair bit jankier than I typically let by, even for something that will be hidden. But at this point, I really just want to see if this puzzle is actually going to work. And it looks like that modification is now putting the nut in the right location, evenly spaced to match the other side. So with that little correction taken care of, I can jump back to finishing the key pin I was working on. Reassembling everything gives me that new measurement I need to remove from the length of the pin, so I'll face this down on the lathe and see how it fits. Perfect. Now the final task of drilling the cross hole in the end for the detent pin. The pin will ride along this face, so I'll use a surface gauge to determine the exact distance from face to face. With the tolerance stack up, this measurement is a little off from expected, but that's why we measure it. So with this new dimension in mind, I can get the key pin set up in a V-block in the mill, find the end and center line of the pin, spot drill, through drill, ream, and realize I messed up yet again. In the excitement of nearing the end, I completely forgot I needed the cross hole to be clocked 90 degrees to the step I cut on the other side. It's close-ish, maybe 70 degrees, but because of how I designed this, it's just not going to work. It has to be 90. I don't even know what to say at this point, but someone's definitely faring better than I am today. Let's try this, hopefully, one final time. Okay, back at the last step of drilling the cross hole. I'll get this set up in the V-block again, but before locking it down, I'll use my itsy bitsy square to line up the step with the vertical vise jaw. Then drill and ream that last hole. Okay, finally we made it. With the addition of this little pin I whipped up earlier with the others, all the parts of the mechanism are complete. But that's only the mechanism. I still have just one more piece to make. The captive of this story. The nut. Almost all these operations are repeats of ones I've already done, so let's just watch the beautiful bronze chips fly. And just like that, the nut's finished. Now that is everything complete. All 14 pieces are ready for assembly, so... Well, doesn't that look snazzy? But how does it work? Time to cast your final guesses at the solution. I'll wait. Okay, let's go. Now the usual trick to a captive nut puzzle is a concealed seam in the threads between the two halves. So if you know about this puzzle, you might try this as your first guess. And you'd be right. The two sides will unscrew, but then they'll stop and won't go any further. Ha, it's a false lead. That shouldered key pin and the cross pin on the other end prevent the two bolt halves from separating. Screwing them back together doesn't do anything, but you might notice this bolt head, while solid when closed, is a little springy when it's loose. So maybe there's something to this. Well, if you mess around with this long enough, you might discover that if you push on the bolt head while screwing the two halves back together, something pops. And now the head can move even more. This is that pocket we milled in the bottom of the bolt head lining up with the step on the end of the key pin. So again, pushing the head while screwing together, the head pops onto the key pin. And if you keep turning, there's a little resistance, then another pop right when this gap closes. And now the other bolt head can move a little. This is that cross pin traversing from the detent on the left to the deeper groove on the right, which changes how far out the top of the key pin protrudes, giving room for the other bolt head to move as well. Then it's just a matter of pushing and twisting the bolt head to relieve it from its J-channel trap on the end. And congratulations, the nut is free. So again, that's run the nut to one side, partially unscrew the bolt, push the bolt head while re-screwing, bing, bang, boom, complete. Pretty neat, right? I really like how this turned out. The fit and finish is just super nice, and feeling the resistance in the mechanism is just the cherry on top. 
After playing with this thing for a while though, I'm having a bit of a hard time judging whether this puzzle is actually tricky. So I found a willing test subject. Meet my friend Craig. He's a local machine shop owner slash entrepreneur slash inventor. And despite his claims of being just a machinist, he's one of the mechanically smartest people I've ever met. So naturally, I wanted to see if I can stump him. Do you know what this is? It's a machinist jack. No. <laughs> you need to be able to get that nut off of there. And I can't use a saw. Please don't. <laughs> Please. <laughs> How many hours of daylight do I have? If you, can, if you can solve it faster than it took me to make it, then, hmm. then you're doing good. What? Oh, a little teaser. <laughs> kind of rooting for me and against me, aren't you, at the same time? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> squishy. Have you ever been more proud of yourself? <laughs> You're close. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like there's like only 12 more things I need to do. It does have to do with this nut. Yeah. With, with this end. Yeah, I, I got a new action going on. What'd you find? I ain't telling you. <laughs> oh. You find it? I'm a genius. <laughs> Dude, you got some tight tolerances here too. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I custom this fit. This band to that, yeah. I custom fit it, yeah. With that closed, that pushes on the tip of that. So when it's all closed, it feels solid, right? So you got tense tolerance. Probably. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, really so good. Partially 90 degree unthread. Pop. That pops in. And then as you continue to turn it, that pin is crossing into that deep. That end. hole continue to turn that thing to let that one go. That's that's better than the old horseshoe one with the ring on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely didn't expect that. It took Craig about 20 minutes to solve this. Maybe this is a little harder than I thought. A pretty good feeling given how much time I put into this. But even if it was a flop and could be solved in a fraction of a second, it was honestly just fun to figure out the mechanism and then figure out how to make it, hiccups and all. And I think my inner hipster is pretty pleased as well. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.